Well, this morning we continue in our study of Philippians and uh, take out your outline. If you're clicking in from online, I want to encourage you, you can go to our website and download the notes. Um, Full notes are there either with the answers or blanks so you can follow along with us. The joyful assurance, what God starts, he completes. What God starts, he completes. And so this morning we come to Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 again. You say, well, wait a minute. Deja vu. Wasn't that last week? And I say, absolutely. God's Word is so good. There's so much there. We could spend, in fact, a year studying these these, uh, very short verses. Um, There is so much here. But we're just going to spend one more Sunday on a very, very important point that is here. Notice with me, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. And this is really the beginning of the letter. Um, Verses 1 and 2 was the introduction. But now he launches straight in to giving thanks to God for the Philippians. Now, this is interesting. He did the same thing in 1 Corinthians with a church that was very misbehaving. He loved the church that didn't do well. He did it also with the Romans that he hadn't met yet. He expressed thanks to them at the beginning of Romans. But here in Philippians 1 through 3, we see a very, very powerful and what we would say is a very intimate Um, statement of of giving thanks and affection for this church. Some have said that the Philippian church was Paul's favorite church. I can tell you that this is my favorite church. I talk to other pastors, and I feel sorry for them. Um, I just, I I often do. I mean, I, I just, as my pastor growing up here in this place said, over and over again, this is the church that I love the most. And I can repeat that. Um, I would rather be here than anywhere else in the world, and I've been a few places in the world. As a missionary, there are other great Christians, there are other great churches, but this is the one that has my heart. And um, I hope and pray that you can share in that too. The Apostle Paul seemed to share that for this church. And so I want you to see here, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, then we'll zip through the review in just a moment and launch right into a very important point that we see in this passage. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now. Verse 6. Let's read it out loud together. Verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Look at verse 8. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So you see, this is, this is a, an affection and a gratitude and a love that pours itself into a prayer. He says, oh God, I am thankful for the Philippian church. He rejoices in what the God has done in them, and he works through them. As we study the background of this letter of Philippians, what we said was Paul the writer was in trouble in all kinds of ways, and the Philippian church was in trouble, but yet it is characterized by joy. And so notice here with me in, in review number one, last week we noticed the great difference in mere friendship and true fellowship. And when we look at this, we see that friendship tends to be built upon shared affinities. Nothing wrong with that. There can be some very deep friendships. But if, if it's really only based on the things that you like and not on other deeper aspects of life, there tends to be a limit on where that friendship will go. Last week, I gave you three examples. Do you remember these three examples? I have them on the screen in front of you. You remember the British ship that was preparing for D-Day and how the crew was together. 
They were really together. And they asked the chaplain after D-Day, why is it not like it was? And he said, it's because we had a shared goal. We had a mission together. We had to do it. And so it didn't matter whether you were the cook or whether you were the engineer or the navigator or the deckhand, we had to do this in order for this great task. Very similarly, we see the story of the band of brothers and how this group comes together in the 101st Airborne Easy Company, and they are identified in this great task, in a powerful, true story of how a band of boys becomes a band of brothers because of their identity and because of their task. And then we also talked about the Fellowship of the Ring, J.R.R. Tolkien's great story of this task that had to be done that was life or death for Middle Earth and this eclectic group of little dwarves and, and hobbits mixed with great warriors, and they form a fellowship with a task that is a glorious story. And so we looked at not just the fellowship of the ring, but the fellowship of the church. We said that there are some similar things to these stories, to these accounts from history. And so we see that true fellowship, fill this in, true fellowship um, comes from an infused common identity. It's that there's this infused identity that comes. And that's whether it's the naval, the British Navy, or the 101st Airborne, or it's the task of the fellowship of taking the ring and seeking for the ring to be destroyed so it would not destroy Middle Earth. It's this infused identity that becomes very, very um, obvious and, and very, very um, life-changing to them. Look at the next part there. It's not just an infused common identity, but it's a pursued common purpose. If you're going to have a real fellowship, you have a real purpose and a real goal in what you're doing, an objective that you fight together for. Now, I did not mention the third one, but as I was praying and thinking about this this week, this third one also became very powerful, and it's true in all of these stories, and it's true in the life of the church. Notice the third one, an opposed common enemy or enemies. You see, when we have um, a common enemy we start to see things more clearly. There's things that become very, very clear as a result of the great threat that is around us. Now, the true church, number four, we said, for the true fellowship for Christians, it's kind of an ultimate fellowship. You see, our infused identity is salvation in Christ. It's going from being someone who does not know God and walk with God to someone who is called God's child. The Bible says that we go from being enemies with God to being friends of God. We, we go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. This is a massive infusion of a new identity. In fact, just remember with me, there was a Jewish leader that came to Jesus in the dark of night because he was kind of afraid to come during the day. His name was Nicodemus. And he said, you're talking about being born again. How can I be born again? I can't enter back into my mother's womb. And Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law and you don't understand this? If you're going to know God, you have to have a spiritual rebirth. That's what it means to be born again. That you, I mean, you're born once into this life physically, but you're born into sin. You don't have to teach a baby to do the wrong thing. They automatically do the wrong thing. You don't have to go any further than looking in your own heart to know that we have a sin problem. And I can say that about my heart knowing clearly that I need a Savior. And that is exactly what happens when we come to Christ. He changes our identity. He, he comes and He changes who we are, that we are no longer bound in our um, earthly um, flesh that is bound in sin and doomed to die, but we come to the salvation of Christ in a new identity. Look at the next one there. Our pursued purpose is His kingdom and eternity. That is what we share as a church. We don't share just 3751 Sheridan Street, a place to meet. We don't just share nursery workers. We don't just share, you know, some common music and some common things like that. Our real sharing goes far beyond, and it goes to a common purpose. And that is why people from different races, different socioeconomic incomes, different backgrounds all together can come together and call one another brother and sister in Christ 
because we have a new identity in him and we have a new purpose and it goes beyond this earthly life. It's a purpose that has an eternal goal. Notice the last one here. Our opposed enemies are Satan and this fallen world. There indeed is a very real adversary. This is not a fairy tale. This is very, very clear. In America, it's pretty hidden. The occult is pretty hidden. Demonic activity is pretty hidden. But you go to many other places. You can find it here increasingly. But you go to other places of the world, and it is an absolute given that the occult is there and that there are demonic forces that are very, very powerful and bring a great deal of fear. Marcy and I have lived in Africa and we have seen and heard in the reality of demonic forces that affect and oppress people. In fact, there are neighborhoods in the Bahamas that I've been speaking with Dan, uh, with Dave Sands and some others here that are from the Bahamas and have said that there are pockets where the occult is very, very powerful. And one of those pockets was on one of the islands that, that really was destroyed. And of course, some are immediately saying, well, this is the judgment of God. Well, let me tell you that it can be the ju- judgment of God every day is on a fallen world. Um, and his prevenient grace is on a fallen world. Um, allowing us to live. Um, But we do see, even in our culture here in the Caribbean and in South Florida, that we have a common enemy. Christians share in this identity, this purpose, and these enemies. Number five, notice here with me, Paul and the Philippian believers display true fellowship in Christ. That's what they display, and that's what you read. If you'll go home today and take 15 minutes and just read these four chapters again, you will see a very true fellowship going back and forth where the Philippian people are loving Paul, and Paul is loving the Philippian people. Number six, one of the things that they share is trouble. Number six, Paul is on death row in Rome, and the Philippians are under persecution and hardship. Both have trouble, and yet Paul is dealing with this trouble through the lens of God's abiding joy. Look at this, number seven. So they have this trouble, yet Paul declares his joyful gratitude, and that's what we can't get away from in this passage, this joyful gratitude to God and his deep affection for his Philippian brothers and sisters in Christ. How does he do this? How? Why does he do this? How can he have this joy? Well, we see this morning the source of the joy, not only for the Philippians, but something that Paul shared as well as being partakers of God's grace. And I want you to see this. Um, Really, some uh, scholars would say this. When you look at these verses, three through eight, the central idea in verses three through eight is verse six. In fact, if you look at this, it it begins to, to be the orientator on what comes up in verses three, four, and five, as well as seven and eight. Let's read it again and let you see this because I want it to be fresh on your mind very clearly before we launch into breaking it down. In verse 3, he says, I thank God, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, for you all, making my prayer with joy. So we keep seeing this again, thanksgiving, gratitude, and joy. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now. So he's thankful because the Philippians, all these years later, 10 to 13 years later, are still engaged with him. Look at verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. We'll talk about what that means. Look at verse 8. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Is there a word that you hear over and over again in these verses? What word do you hear? Look at it. What word is there that appears over and over again? How about the word all? 
Now, Pastor Billingsley used to say, this is how we knew Paul was a southerner, because he was always talking about y'all. Um, <laughs> But you see this over and over again. Look what he says. I thank my God in all my... This is a, this is a powerful statement of extremes. I mean, he, he's talking about um, uh, a very demonstrative uh, language, talking through a very demonstrative language here. All of my remembrance to you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all. He's talking about not just a few of them. He's talking about all of them. He cared about all of the church. He didn't just care about the ones who were getting along well. He didn't just care about the ones who remembered him or, or whatever. He was talking about the whole church. And so, you know, that's, there's some important lessons in there for us. When we talk about fellowship in the life of the church, we need to love the whole church. You know, we, do, we don't really have it. It's kind of like your family at home. You know, you, you have some family members that may be, quote unquote, easier to love than others. I don't know, but you need to love all of them. I mean, this is the, the mind and the heart of God, the design of God, that we love all of our family. And notice here, we, in the life of the church, we see the Apostle Paul's example that he loves all of the family that is here. And he sees them all in that partnership. Um, it is right for me to feel this way uh, about you all, because I hold you in my heart, and you are all partakers with me. Do you see that over and over again coming up? I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So there's this, there's this beautiful, comprehensive nature of coming together and seeing this great uh, power in these statements. Notice this on your outline, and just kind of go down there toward the bottom. The joyful assurance of God's saving work in your life. And we're going to move quickly here. Number one, Paul is grateful for God's work in the Philippians. He's saying that God has done a work in them, and he is grateful that God has done a work in them. He has brought salvation to them. Look in verse 6. Look what it says. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. This is God's work in them. And God's work in them partaking with him. And that's what brings us to the next part. Not only God's work in the Philippians, but he's also thankful for their partnership with him. He has been sent out to take the gospel to new places, and these people experienced Paul's message. They experienced Paul's love. God moves in their heart, and when, when Paul leaves, they continue to support him. They partner with him. How do they partner with him? See, there is great evidence of them having a saving faith. He has um, uh, mentioned several things in this letter all the way through and even in other letters that let us know that Paul says, man, the Philippian church is a group of people who love God, and there's evidence. Number Letter A is there, they loved him and he loved them. So there's this love that exists between them. And this is an evidence that God has worked and moved in their heart. They love the fact that he is a preacher of the gospel. They love the fact that he has sown into their lives. They appreciate what he's done. Number two, letter B there, they listened to him. You see, from the first day on, they listened to him. And you can write out there to the side, Lydia and the jailer. And others, we, those are just two names that we see from Acts 16. But they listened to him and received the gospel. Letter C, they prayed for him. If you skip over in chapter 1 and verse 19, you see that he says, you prayed for me in all of these things. Look at letter D, they sent him support numerous times. Now, this is an important one. We see it over and over again. Listen to this. When he went to Rome, they sent him support. When he went to Corinth, they sent him support. When he went to uh, uh, Thessalonica, they sent, him, um, they sent him support. They were supporting his work. Now, you've often heard it said, if you really mean something, then put your money where your mouth is, right? This was a church that didn't just say that they loved Paul and they loved the gospel and they loved the gospel going into new places. This is a church who put their money where their mouth was. They sacrificed. And let me tell you that we see a lot in this that their, that their economic circumstances were very bad. 
The, the churches of Macedonia were plagued with all kinds of economic hardships, including famine. I mean, there was a lack of food in their midst. That means prices for food went way up. That means that there was a lot of things about life that were hard. And here, they're still sending Paul the support that he needs to continue in this. And they were loving one another as they cared for one another and supported one another. Letter E in verse 7, it says that they were concerned for him, um, that they were concerned about his welfare. And then letter F, notice there, they stood strong in the gospel. Notice in verse 7, it says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace. Look what it says, both in my imprisonment. So they're, they're, they're concerned for him while he's in prison and they're standing with him while he's in prison. And then look at the next part there at the end of verse 7. Look what it says. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So the Philippians were not flaking out on their theology. The Philippians, all these years later, more than a decade later, did not just receive Greek ideas and mix them with Christianity or Jewish ideas and mix them with Christianity like so many churches did. The picture here is the Philippian church was holding on to the gospel. And look what it says there. There's two words. And in the defense, circle the word defense, and confirmation, both of those are legal terms. Apologia is defense, and the idea of confirmation is coming and testifying that, yes, this is true. So it's a testimony of the gospel. This is very important. We see them not only loving and feeling and praying and being concerned and supporting financially, but we see them holding fast. My friends, Sheridan Hills needs to do all of these things as a body together. Sheridan Hills needs to love one another and care for one another and support one another. And we need to support the ministry of the gospel, taking it to the far off places. This is why part of in your bulletin, once a, or once every two months, you get one of these as you are challenged to remember and pray for the affordance of the gospel. We have IMB missionaries around the world. I spoke with one of our missionaries at six o'clock this morning in the Middle East, in a, in a town, excuse me, in a country that I cannot even mention. It's one of the most closed countries on the earth. And they grew up from here at Sheridan Hills, and there they are, faithfully serving. 35 years later, people are coming to faith behind the wall of Islam. It is, it is a beautiful and wonderful thing. It is right that we, like the Philippian church, support missions, taking the gospel, fulfilling Jesus' command to go and make disciples of the nations. This is, this is glorifying to God. So he begins a good work in us, and he continues that work through us. We see this. We shouldn't miss these things that is part of who these people are. And we should seek to be like them. We should seek to be like them as a husband and wife or as a single person, as a senior. We should seek to be like them as parents. We should hold on to the gospel. We should stand strong in the gospel. We should make a defense for it. We should testify to it. We should know what it means. We should know what we believe. Otherwise, the culture around us is going to knock us over. This is why we study the Bible. This is why you have a three-page outline. We want to pay attention to what God's Word says. Notice here, and fill this in on the bottom, even though this, this great evidence of saving faith is seen here, the verse in verse 6 makes this point. Good works are the fruit, not the root of true salvation. Good works are the fruit. Now, I've listed here, A through F, these are good works. These are good things that they're doing. These are good things about them. Be careful, I don't want you to miss one thing. You just, you just look, 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 look. But these are not what save these people. And chapter, or verse 6 is making that point. M verse 6 is the anchor thought 
that says it is God who has done this. Ultimately, he's thanking God for his work. He's thanking God for the Philippians. He's thanking God for what is good in the Philippian people because God is the one who works in them. Let's unpack that a little bit. Turn your page. You can safely go to page two. Notice number two, true joyful assurance. You see, Paul was assured about their faith. Paul knew that they loved God. Paul knew of their salvation. True joyful assurance comes from God's work, not our work. Can we read that out loud together? Number two says what? True joyful assurance comes from God's work, not our work. You see, our work falters. If it's something that, that just the pastors are orchestrating and, you know, we're making up the theology and we're making up the philosophy of and we're making up the strategy, listen, that will just falter. Or if you in your life, you're getting together all of your, you're getting together your routine and your thing and you're going you're gonna to be good for God and all of that kind of thing. Those are all of your works and that's going to falter. We are flawed, fallen human beings in a flawed and fallen world, which is why we need to know what God's work is and what God's Word says about how to do His work. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is commending in them. Notice here that he says this, and we're going to under, unpack this just a tad. It says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I have underlined that where it says, he who began, because here is a very key and interesting key word. And it shows us, as I've put here, it wasn't Paul's work. It wasn't the Philippians' work. It was God's work that saved them. So everything starts with their salvation, and it was God's work that saves them. Notice the word began. The word began in archomai. In archomai means this. It's a Greek word. It means to begin or to inaugurate. It, it really means to start, this, this whole picture of it being started. This word is only used twice in the entire New Testament. So a lot of words are used repeatedly, a lot of words are used hundreds of times, even thousands of times, different words. But this is a very unique Greek word. One step back from what we call hypox legom legomena, so that you're being used once. Here it is, it's only used twice, and in both times when this word is used, it's regarding salvation. We see it in verse 6 where he says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in Christ Jesus. And then in Galatians 3, we see it again, and it's very, very powerful in what he's saying. Now, the Galatian church weren't quite as good, boys and girls, as the Philippian church. The Galatian church were dealing with some real temptations to add Jewish tradition and Jewish law on top of the gospel. And so Paul was having to straighten that out, and he was having to call them account. So the letter of Galatians is a little different lingo than the letter of Philippians. Look what he says in chapter 3 and verse 1. What does it start with in verse 1? That was very weak. What does it start with in verse 1? It says... We don't want to hear, oh, foolish Sheridan Hillians. We don't want to hear that. We want to keep our theology right. And so here we see Apostle Paul is just pulling, I mean, he is going for it. Look what he says in verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And what's the answer to that? By hearing with faith. We receive God's Spirit not by being good through doing the law. 
We receive God's Spirit by faith in His promise and by faith in what He has done and said. So look what He says there. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 3, are you so foolish, having, be, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh? You see, human beings constantly keep going back to, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And how, how can I make up for my sin? How can I make up for this? Instead of looking continually to the simple gospel of God in Christ Jesus that says, God came and paid for your sins. You cannot pay for your sins. You cannot make up for your sins. You cannot do penance for your sins. Jesus paid it, and he paid it all. And he calls us to come and recognize this beautiful gift, this beautiful promise. You cannot add to what Jesus did on the cross. We said this Wednesday night at Secret Church, that when we try to add to what Jesus did on the cross, what we're saying is the death of Christ wasn't good enough. And he was the sinless son of God who laid down his life for our sins. So my friends, the salvation of God is seen as God's work, not our work. And we see that in verse 6. Look at verse 6 again. I want you to see this. It says, and I'm sure of this, that circle the word he. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And the picture is this. God brought salvation to your life. You see, fill this in down there at the, at the bullet point. Salvation is solely a gracious work of God. A gracious work of God means it comes from His grace. It comes from His generosity and goodness and forgiveness through His grace. Look at the next part. God requires faith for salvation. And that's what Paul was just dealing with with the Galatians. It's not in your works. It's by faith. So notice the bullet point, second point, bullet point. God requires faith for salvation. But it is not something anyone can take credit for. So your faith is not, listen to this, attributed to you. Look at the next part. This is very important. Salvation comes by the power of God. The only way that you're saved is by the power of God, not your power. It comes by the power of God in response to faith. So when there is faith in you in believing upon the gospel of Christ, salvation comes to you. Well, then how do we get faith? This next one is very important. Faith itself is God's work. It is divinely began and finished. Now, this is cloudy to a lot of people. A lot of people think that, oh, well, God gives grace and we have to come up with the faith. And I would say to you that there are a myriad of passages in the Bible that says, eh, not that simple. It's actually maybe even more simple than that, in that God gives grace, but he also moves in your heart and gives you faith. And that way, there can be no confusion about the reason that you're saved. The only reason that you're saved is because God saved you. God even gives you the faith to believe. And there, this is just what the Scripture makes so very clear. I want you to see it in the Scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. We often leave off verse 10, but it fits right here very powerfully. And notice, you can see it on the screen or you can see it on your outline here. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. You see, even your faith is not your own doing. Look what it is. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Look at verse 10. For we are, circle it, his. We are 
his workmanship. It's not you are Paul's workmanship, you are Billingsley's workmanship, you are Almeida's workmanship. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and this is that new birth that Nicodemus was asking about. You are recreated, you are reborn in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you to start to have a bigger and bigger and bigger view, listen to this, of God's role in your salvation. I want you to start to have a, a more biblical view about that it's not in me, but it's all in Him. We just sang it. It's not in me. It's, it's not in me. It's, it's yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. This is God's gracious work. And this takes off so much pressure. And there's so many people that either they've never come to faith in Christ because they're thinking, I've got to come up with all this. And we're just, we're just saying, listen to what the gospel says. And if God gives you the grace to believe, then, then run to him and believe. Or what about Christians that maybe they, they trust him at the beginning of their salvation, but then they are struggling with all of these other areas of where's the victory going to come, and what about all this? Listen, Galatians 2.20 says, it's not you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. Let me give you a great bit of fresh air and just say, just run to Christ. Let him overcome the things in your life that you cannot overcome. This is his whole design that his power would live through you and that you discover what it means to humbly walk with God. Look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29. For it has been granted to you. Wow. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ. You should not only believe in him, so that's, it's been granted to you to believe, but to also suffer for his sake. Now, that's a sermon for another time, um, the last part of that. You mean God has granted suffering? Well, there, there's a good theology of suffering that understands that some of the greatest blessings in your life may even be some of the suffering. I mean, that's not what the world, that's not the popular gospel of the world. It's not what the world necessarily wants to hear, and it's certainly not the, the prosperity gospel that is so prevalent in our world today. But God knows what He's doing. He knows what's best for you. And sometimes what's best for you may not be super simple and super comfortable. But look what it says, for it is God, excuse me, for it has been granted to you that you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer as His name. So, believing in Him is granted from God. Look at Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So, He changes your will, He changes your desire, and He gives you the strength to do it. And some of you just feel relieved right now as I'm saying this. You can say, oh, it's not supposed to be all about me. It's, it's letting God do that in me. And there's some ways that we do that, but this is a beautiful thing. Look at Acts chapter 11, and verses 1 through 2, and then verses 18. And this is when the Jews realize, look at this, this is when the Jews realize that the gospel is for the Gentiles too. You see, at first, the Jewish people that became Christians, that began to believe that Jesus indeed was the Messiah, at first they thought, oh, well, this is really um, just for Jewish people. And then Peter is out there preaching, and the Apostle Paul is out there preaching, and then we start to see Gentiles getting saved, non-Jews getting saved, Greeks and Romans getting saved, and then they start to realize, oh, the gospel is for them too. Well, in the process, this statement is made. Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. You see, God has given this. Salvation is from God. It's not that the Gentiles just decided, oh, I guess we'll believe. You see, here's something that also is helpful for us, I think, and it's at the bottom of your page by that bullet point. Some people believe readily. And right above there, or, or you just look below there, um, actually, Acts chapter 16 and verse 4. Do you remember how Lydia came to faith? We read it two weeks ago. Apostle Paul shows up in Philippi. 
and he's looking for any religious people that maybe he's going to go kind of to the Jews first when he goes to a town. There's not hardly any Jews there, but he knows that outside the city gate, a group of religious people may meet out by the river, um, common practice in that day. And so he goes out there looking for them, and he finds a group of people. He starts speaking the gospel to them, saying, hey, a Savior has died for you, and his name was Jesus of Nazareth. He came, he laid down his life, he rose again so that you can live and you can see that he is the Messiah. The Messiah has come. And it says here, look what it says in ver- chapter 16 and verse 14. Would you read that out loud with me, what I've underlined there? Read out loud what it says. Acts 16, verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by Paul. Isn't that beautiful? We see that it's the Lord who opened her heart to respond. And so some people believe readily. She heard it and she believes. Now let's go a few weeks down the road. There's a demon-possessed girl chasing Paul and Silas around in town as they're trying to talk to people and preaching the gospel in town. And the demon-possessed girl keeps saying all these things. These men are the most high God, are from the most high God. And, and it's, a, it's a very... So people would have heard the gospel, especially where there was a crowd. It is very likely that the Philippian jailer who was in charge of the da- jail downtown for the Romans, it's very likely that he had heard the gospel. And it's very likely that he was a tough rough Roman dude that had no time for these religious fanatics. And somewhere along the way, we see this controversy, and the Lord comes and brings about a circumstance where Paul and Silas are thrown in that jailer's jail. And in the middle of the night, there is an earthquake. He thinks everyone has escaped. He's contemplating, contemplating suicide. And there in the midst of this dramatic circumstance, he hears, don't hurt yourself. And he eventually says, what must I do to be saved? The man is broken and moved from going from being a rough and tumble Roman jailer to being who had just beaten these men with rods to seeing the grace of God in his life. So the second point is here is that some believe hesitatingly. And I think it would be reasonable to say that the Philippian jailer would have been one of those who believed hesitatingly. It took an earthquake and it took him thinking his life was over before he heard the gospel that they had been singing, that they had been preaching, and he believes. Now, some of you, you heard the gospel and you readily believed. Others of you, man, it was a long fight. It was, you were a hard nut on this. And it was really, really difficult. And there's some in this room this morning right now, they're saying, I'm here, I'm listening for whatever reasons, but I know that I haven't believed. I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm hearing what is being said. And, and, and I'm glad to be here this morning. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But, but I'm here, and, and I'm listening, but I'm, I'm still hesitating on this. Well, you're in good company because there's a lot of other people that are like that too. But listen to this. I want you to hear about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was one of the greatest, most brilliant literary minds in the last 100, 150 years. And do you know anything about C.S. Lewis's conversion? I want you to hear this. C.S. Lewis was a brilliant scholar, British scholar, who also was a hardened agnostic, a hardened agnostic. He was a hardened agnostic, which means that he was unconvinced that God existed, and he was unconvinced that the gospel of Christ was true. Yet God sought him, and God found him. In his autobiography entitled Surprise by Joy, by the way, that's the name of his autobiography, he tells what happened about his conversion. After years of resistance, in the spring semester of 1929, this is when he was at Oxford, in 1929, I finally gave in. I admitted that God was God, and I knelt down and prayed for the first time. 
That night, I was sure to be the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I did not see then what is the most shining and obvious thing now, the divine grace and humility of God that would accept a convert with a pathetic as faith as mine. The prodigal son at least walked home to his father on his own feet. But how amazing the love of God, I love this, how amazing the love of God that would open the high gates of heaven to a prodigal like me who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and with darting eyes in every direction looking for a way of escape. C.S. Lewis said he just didn't go down easy. C.S. Lewis was looking for a way of escape. I, I don't want to believe this. And yet God came after him. Listen to this. Years later, Eternity Magazine would report another story about C.S. Lewis. And many years later, published an interesting article entitled Encountering, uh, Encounter with the Light, um, telling of a young atheistic student at Oxford who heard C.S. Lewis and began corresponding with him. So they began writing letters back and forth. As the student began sharing and trying to defend his doubts and questions to the famous scholar, Dr. Lewis responded very simply, I think you are already in the catch of his net. The Holy Spirit is after you, and I doubt if you're going to get away. Not long afterward, the atheistic student pursued by God for so long, finally surrendered to Christ. He had found, as the good Dr. Lewis himself had found, that salvation is of God. He ran, but God ran faster and successfully captured his heart and his mind. My friends, whether it's Lydia gladly hearing and believing, or whether it's the jailer, in the earthquake, in the threat of his own life being lost, in God working and moving in his heart. My friends, salvation is of God. Finally, I just want you to see very quickly, some believe readily and some believe hesitatingly. God is glorified in both. God is glorified in both. Notice this, salvation is solely by God's grace undeserved favor. This is the glorious gospel of Christ, that it's by His grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Look what it says in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You didn't miss anything. You didn't, he didn't hold back anything. He gives you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places when you get Christ. Now look at verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. You see, this is salvation. In him he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to what? The purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. You see, this, this is a display of his grace when he calls you to himself and he saves you and he gives you the faith to believe and you believe upon him and you stand there and you say, it's not what I have done. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross I cling. I mean, it's not what I've done. It's his will. It's his grace for his glory. In the middle of verse 6, it says, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of what? His grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Here's the picture. Creation, fall, redemption, and then glory. You see all of that in these verses. God's grand plan, creation, 
We fall into our sin. The world is lost in that. God has a great plan of redeeming us to himself, and then he's going to restore it, and we see all of this in Christ. You see, salvation is solely of God's grace. Look at John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 36, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. This is talking about all the people, all the souls that the Father gives me will come to me, Jesus says. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You see, salvation is of God. The Father gives to the Son those who believe. Look at verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is talking about people, that God is not going to lose anyone that he has called to himself. And Jesus says, I will raise them up on the last day. Look at verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And what does it say at the end? And I will raise him up on the last day. You see, this is what verse 6 is talking about. Look up at the top of the page in verse 6 again. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He is going to raise you up and bring you safely home to heaven. This is the gospel of Christ. And this is the glory of God's salvation. And there are some who say, eh, no thanks. And there are some who go, eh, no thanks. And God is saying, not so fast. Do you want to do this the easy way or the hard way? You know, some of you are waiting on God to do it the hard way. I want to encourage you not to do that. I want to encourage you to just run to him. I mean, this is good news. This isn't bad stuff. This is, I mean, it's talking about like being raised from the dead. That, that's pretty good. As opposed to being a candle that the wind blows out and it's over. I mean, when there's this whole body of evidence that there's so much more. Friend, I would just, if you hear his voice today calling you to believe, I would just, I would say, Lord, help me believe. Notice John 6, 44, waters it in as we close. No one can come to me, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Is God drawing you? Is he putting things in your life? Are there messages in your life? Are there circumstances in your life where God is saying, come, come to me? Maybe he's doing it through a friend, maybe a colleague at work. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's just you've stumbled in here and you're hearing this message alone. And God is saying, I brought you here for a reason. Just come to me and believe. And look at the beautiful promise that he makes to you, and I will raise him up on the last day. Here's the gospel. The gospel is this. The good news, you say, what's the gospel? Well, you know, you just notice this on your outline. The good news that Christ died in the place of sinners to save them from their sin. And all who believe in him and receive him will be eternally saved from being cut off from God. That's good news. Now, notice these last things. Have you heard the gospel and believed it? Then rejoice. 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 Perhaps you're like the Philippians that have heard the gospel and believed it. Rejoice. Also take heart that God is going to see you through. If you're a Christian, understand this. You can trust him. You can trust him with the rest of your life. That he's going to see you through as a Christian. He's going to sustain your faith. He's going to hold you to him. Now, he does that through means of grace in the church and through friends and the preaching of the word and reading the Bible. That's how he holds you. And I believe that if you're truly saved, you're going to persevere until the end and walk with him. And all of that is a testimony of his grace. 
But what about the next part? Have you heard the gospel and not believed it? Then I would call you today to reconsider. I would call you today to consider again the gospel and say, is God calling me? Is he speaking to my heart through the people around me? Is he speaking to my heart through this message? Is he speaking to my heart through the circumstances of life? Look at the end. Perhaps you might begin praying, Lord, help my unbelief. Come do what I cannot do. Would you bow your head and pray with me?